Thanks very much, General Pollitt. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to join you, the cross-section that's represented here from civilians in the department to military to industry are the critical ingredients to making our IT enterprise work. I actually tried to join you last year in Nashville, but as many of you know, it, it, the water got a little too high in the hotel. Uh, I think it got up to the second floor, so I had to, had to cancel. As I saw the rain come in over the weekend, I was uh, a little worried about uh, this event and was wondering whether it was uh, you all or whether it was me that was causing this. But I, um, Happy to, uh, that we were able to uh, survive the, the floods and, uh, and get here today. Uh, General Pollitt was very, very kind in his introduction, uh, but the truth is uh, he doesn't actually understand my job. See, General Pollitt is not a deputy. He's a principal. He has a deputy. Uh, and what, what that means is w when you're a deputy, there are a whole series of people, in my case undersecretaries, who... Uh, handle all these issues and basically they pick off all the easy issues and they make decisions and then they issue a press release and then they tell me about it and take credit. Uh, so only the truly horrible issues make it through. The ones that have a bad decision and a really bad decision. Uh, you really just decide who it is, what group, what constituency you want to make angry or how many groups you want to make angry. And once in a while, one of these sexy issues slips through this screen of undersecretaries. And at that point, the secretary reaches down, grabs that issue, and says, you don't worry about that big guy, I got it. And so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a, a challenge being a deputy, and, and uh, I just wanted to share that with you. But I, I, in all seriousness, I wanted to congratulate uh, General Pollitt on, on his impressive record at, at DISA. He's been here since uh, December 2008. He's guided DISA during a time of enormous uh, change. He's helped establish the roadmap and the direction on technology that is going to change us into an enterprise service platform. He's worked closely with the Pentagon to adapt to the changes affecting the department and in particular, he's shown strong leadership in making the BRAC move up here to Fort Meade. I understand moves like this are never easy on the individuals or the families, and they're certainly not easy for an entire agency, especially when it involves a commute in the Washington area traffic. The Baltimore Parkway is not for the faint of heart. The fact that DISA's move went so smoothly is a testament to General Pollitt's leadership and to the resilience of the DISA staff. So on behalf of the department, I want to express my appreciation to each and every one of you for making this work. Across the department, we face another kind of transition, one in which the future of our forces and our security depends. And in this transition, DISA is again on the front lines. Information technologies have revolutionized how our military organizes, trains, fights, and equips. The information backbone that DISA provides enables our most important military capabilities, from ISR to global strike, from navigation to command and control. Our defense community relies on the networks that you are responsible for. You provide the IT foundation that makes our fighting force the most effective in the world. And you do this at a time when technology is changing. The same adaptability that you showed in making the move up to Fort Meade is exactly how DISA is responding to the technological changes that we face today. And the increase in cyber threats is, is exactly one of those changes. The threat in the cyber arena is growing and changing, and I've spent a part of my tenure as Deputy Secretary focusing deeply on the cybersecurity threat. Indeed, I focus so deeply that certain members of my staff think that they deserve honorary degrees in computer science just for being part of this. Now, the work 
One part of the work culminated in the last, uh, last month when we issued the first ever defense cyber strategy, the defense strategy for operating in cyberspace. The strategy illustrates how cyber is an issue that demands full attention from the entire department. The reality is that our reliance on IT presents not only significant military advantages and enables military capabilities, but it also offers or provides our adversaries with significant vulnerabilities. To date, the most prevalent cyber threats have been those of exploitation. On the government side, they've been intrusions that have stolen military secrets, operational plans, uh, generally from foreign intelligence services. On the commercial side, it's theft of intellectual property from universities and from commercial entities. Now, exploitation may not have the same concrete, visible impacts of a military attack, but over time it has a truly corrosive impact by eroding our commercial advantages and our competitiveness in the global economy, as well as our competitive advantages in military technologies. More recently, a second cyber threat has emerged, and that's a threat of disruption, where adversaries seek to deny or degrade our networks through botnet attacks, through distributed denial of services attacks. We saw these in Estonia and Georgia a couple of years ago. Uh, we've seen them in the commercial space against banks and other uh, entities. Now, the effect here to this point has usually been relatively temporary and reversible, but nevertheless there's been resulting economic damage and loss of confidence. More importantly, the disruptive attacks so f that we've seen so far are relatively unsophisticated. There's no reason that more capable adversaries cannot and will not eventually try and develop much more sophisticated disruptive attacks that mo immobilize whole networks for much longer periods of time. Still further down the, the threat spectrum, or up the threat spectrum, is the threat of disruptive, uh, excuse me, destructive attacks. Now we really haven't seen very many, if any, destructive attacks to this point, but we know the cyber tools are out there to enable those attacks. And this type of threat marks a strategic shift in the cyber threat. It's clear that the capability exists. It is clear that there are actors out there who have those capabilities. So it's, it's possible to imagine attacks on critical infrastructure that will ultimately cause true destruction and ultimately loss of life. Now, it's possible we'll never see this kind of attack. But regrettably, in the history of warfare, there's seldom, if ever, been a weapon developed that hasn't been used. So we must be prepared. We must be prepared for this shift up the ladder of escalation in terms of the cyber threat. And we must be prepared for a shift out from these capabilities being largely in the hands of nation states, relatively sophisticated nation states. We must anticipate that they're going to be acquired by rogue states and ultimately by terrorist groups. When we see that marriage of capability for destructive attacks and true intent to harm the United States, that's, I think, when we'll see the threat having fully matured. We haven't seen it yet. We probably have some time before it does mature, but we don't know how much. So in the face of this threat, we have a window of opportunity to develop much more substantial defenses, not only of our military networks, our government networks, but also the networks that support our critical infrastructure. For this reason, we developed the cyber strategy that I just, that I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. It's intended to guide how our military trains, equips, and commands its forces for the cyber mission, and it's based on five pillars. The first pillar is to treat cyberspace as an operational domain, that it's like land, sea, air, and space. We need to be able to defend in that domain, and we need, need to be able to operate freely in that domain. 
And it's for that reason we set up the Cyber Command that you'll be a part of up here at Fort Meade. Uh, it's for that reason that we are try developing doctrine, that we're developing service entities to so support the Cyber Command and treating this like any other military challenge that we face. The second pillar is that we cannot rely solely on passive defenses, that is, network intrusion uh, uh, techniques, uh, firewalls, uh, and other passive measures, that we need active defenses. We need to be able to hunt on our own networks. We need to be able to anticipate threats and parry them uh, before they arrive. We need to be able to operate at network speeds. The third pillar of the strategy is that we need to apply these active defenses to our critical infrastructure. The infrastructure that supports our financial sector, our power sector, our transportation sector. That those things are critical to our national security and that if we protect our military networks effectively and the power grid goes down, we're not going to feel too good about it how we did. We need, in addition to protect these critical infrastructure sectors, to be able to protect the operation of our national economy. Adversaries could do great economic damage to us through this, this vector. So we need to ensure that we have a public-private partnership that protects those critical infrastructure. This is not a type of problem like, say, air defense, where the military can take the mission largely on its own. But nor is it a, a area in which the private sector can do everything they need to do on their own. It has to be a partnership between both, between the, the types of capabilities and intelligence the government can bring and the types of capabilities and technology the private sector can bring. And those two need to be combined to protect our critical infrastructure. Fourth, we need to follow the principle of collective defense. We need to work with our allies so we better understand the threat, so that we see it earlier, so that we combine our resources to develop the technologies to meet those threats, and that we use the alliance system in this area as we have in other areas to improve our security. Finally, the fifth pillar is that we need to invest in technologies that are going to help remedy the offense-defense Im imbalance in the Internet. I think it's possible, or at this point in the internet, the attacker has all the advantages. The defender has very, uh, very few resources to meet those attacker's advantages. We need to shift that balance. And I think that by investing in better encryption technologies and using encryption when, uh, so that it isn't competing with processing so that we can indeed uh, process encrypted data with uh, out loss of speed, those kinds of technologies will start to raise the cost for the attacker and better balance the, the, the Internet itself without use, losing the advantages the Internet has brought us in terms of expansion, in terms of uh, transparency, uh, in terms of the ease of the introduction of, of technology. Now, DISA plays a crucial role in all five of these pillars. Nowhere is that role more important than in DISA's support of the Cyber Command. As part of Cyber Command, DISA has operational control over our networks. Now, I know the move to Fort Meade has been difficult, but I think by consolidating our cyber expertise up here at Fort Meade, it will reinforce our cybersecurity efforts and bring two, true synergy into the different parts of the enterprise. DISA's industry partners are also a key to our cyber strategy. Indeed, our networks are almost entirely operated and owned in the, by the private sector. We rely on private sector networks and services to operate nearly every facet of the department. The fact is our industry partners are subject to threats just as we have faced them in the dot mill world. It's a significant concern that over the past decade we've lost terabytes of data to foreign intruders, to foreign intelligence services, to attacks on corporate networks of defense companies. Some of the stolen data is mundane, specifications for small parts, tanks, airplanes, submarines. 
but a great deal of it concerns our most sensitive systems, aircraft avionics, surveillance technologies, satellite com communication systems, and network security protocols. We at DOD understand that we must help our partners protect the information on their networks. So together with the Department of Homeland Security, we've launched something called the DIB pilot. That's the Defense Industrial Base Cyber Pilot. It's intended to demonstrate that we can utilize this public-private partnership to protect critical infrastructure networks, starting with the defense sector. What it does is bring intelligence from Cyber Command and NSA about the threat into the defense companies to help improve their defenses. It's the special, that intelligence is the special sauce that improves their defenses. We also are working with them to develop better active defense technologies. And between loading these new signatures into the system and utilizing these new technologies, we think we can develop more effective cyber security. And we're in the process of a 90-day pilot that involves about 20 defense companies to demonstrate that, uh, that objective. Already, we're in the midst of the pilot. Already, the pilot has shown that it stops hundreds of signatures that we wouldn't previously have seen. It appears to be cost effective. We appear to have a strong public-private partnership. We're able to do this within our existing legal structure. So in the coming months, we're looking at the possibility of deepening the defense, defense industry involvement in this pilot, bringing more and more companies. And we're working in the interagency process to look at whether we should apply this same concept to other sectors, whether it's the power sector, nuclear energy, the transportation uh, sector, or the financial sector. We're going to need your help to make this work. We're going to need, indeed, the support of DISA and all our industry partners to make this concept work. We're developing this cyber strategy at the same time as we're entering a period of significant resource constraints. For the past decade, we've lived in a world where if we faced a significant problem or a new mission, we've added resources. We've written a check. Those days are over. Going forward, we are not going to have that luxury. If we're going to face hard choices. When we have new missions, we're going to have to give up old missions. When we have new programs, we're going to have to curtail old programs. Our challenge is going to be to accommodate our changing fiscal circumstances without undercutting our military effectiveness. Information technology has a unique role in contributing to maintaining military effectiveness in a period of a budget slowdown. One of the few areas that I think that we're going to be able to find pure efficiencies is in information technology. By pure efficiency, I mean do, being able to do the same thing, the same mission, for less money. Deploying new information technology has that potential. For example, cloud computing offers the opportunity to get the same level or greater service with the same level or greater security with significantly reduced uh, operating costs and significantly re reduced equipment costs. Similarly, consolidating data centers can yield significant savings, again, without a loss of capability. To help guide us through these changes, we're lucky to have an extremely talented and qualified leader at the helm. Our new CIO, or not so new, she's been here uh, almost a year now, uh, Terry Takai is here with us today, and she's been doing a terrific job of working with myself and Secretary Panetta and General Pollitt to lead our efforts to streamline IT operations and improve our IT investments. This is not only central to the warfighter, it's central to the running of the entire department. The message I'd like to leave you with today is that you are central to the effective operation of the entire department, especially during an era of budget slowdowns. We're going to need your experience, your judgment, your initiative to help modernize the department while we operate with fewer resources. 
Your efforts will indeed save the taxpayer dollars, but more importantly, they will benefit the warfighter by yielding dividends on the battlefield and saving lives. We're at two inflection points. The role of IT and cybersecurity in military power is changing, and the role of IT in helping manage in our current fiscal situation is critical. As IT professionals, you are on the front lines on both of these fronts. You can identify areas where we can save money, and your work will provide the technology to the warfighter that will maintain the advantages that we have today. So I'd like to thank all of you at DISA and all of its partners for the vital contributions that you make. As the theme of the conference notes, we're all part of the power to connect. Thank you.